Ernest, how are you? We'll start shortly. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. How are you doing? We're starting in about a minute. So we're going to talk about the project first. So make sure you log on Canvas. Welcome. <clears throat> we'll start right now, actually. <clears throat> so um, as people are coming in, I had posted a few things. Um, if you're looking for internship, I added some internship link for you to look at. Um, these are just general. Some of them are year round, but most of them are summer 2022 so you can take a look at even I think um when I was looking at the some of the government website they they actually like DOD they already closed their internship for the summer but you do have a lot of really great opportunity in California um, if you're looking for that there is one that's going to be remote so you can check out the summer internship and you can plan on um, applying for those if you like. And when you look at that, you can just go to modules and it's at the bottom. Okay. All the way at the bottom. So it will be right there. So next, I'm going to talk about our course project. And the course project is going to be due at the end of the semester. Um, there are some parts that are going to be due earlier. Actually, let me fix this right now. Let me change this real quick. I have the due date as that. So <clears throat> we'll make it the 16th. OK. So how you can view your project is click on modules and then you're going to go down to the bottom. After this week material, you will find your course project. Um, the first page is generally just list objective of the project. Um, basically, we apply the principles and the theory that we've learned along with implementing algorithm in C++. Um, we are going to pick a case that's going to be appropriate um, based on your choice. Okay. So after the objective page, if you click next, it gives you the project criteria. So there are three parts to this project. The first part is for you to sign up for your own project, or if you decide to work with other people in the group. Um, I only allow maximum of three people per team. Um, anything above seems large to me and there will be people who don't do anything. So <clears throat> I want you to equally contribute if possible. Um, so the first part is to just sign up for your own project or if you're working with a group sign up, you will get 20 points for that. And I'll explain how you can submit that. Um, the second part to this is to write a C++ program along with providing the documentation um, that takes up the majority of your project grade, which is 200 points. And I do have a rubric that I use um, for that. So we'll, we'll take a look at part two. And then part three is to do your self and team evaluation. So if you're working by yourself, you will need to evaluate yourself. Or if you're working with a team, you will have to do both. Um, basically, it's a short form using Google Form, and you would fill that out. Along with that, you would need to post your project on GitHub. 
this semester I'm going to require GitHub as you know I want it for you to explore GitHub a little bit more if for those of you who will work with it already that will be fine so I will touch on that as well okay so the main component of your program is going to come from part two and um, in this document it gives you the overview of what your project would look like so what we want to do is we want to be able to apply our concept in the programming. And then, um, so in the first case, if you pick the first case, this is gonna be um, what they call a travel salesman case. And we are gonna apply mapping concept, which we are gonna learn today. So given that you have these four city and the the, the salesperson is going to travel a certain route. So your goal in this is to be able to program in C++ and determine the shortest path for your travel sales person to be able to achieve. And it, it gives you the details here. So it says that assuming that the marketing specialist begins the trip from home, which is in Riverside, and returns home every day. Um, determine the variations of your trip noted based on the city and the mileage. Okay. Determine the shortest path and the low, most low cost trip. So that will be two different things. And for the, for the marketing specialist to travel, you are going to write a C++ program um, to provide the presentation of the trips low cost and shortest path, including the matrices and the adjacency. So we are gonna do a lab on this today. So that gives you a little bit better understanding on what that would be. This particular program combines combinatorics, which is combinations of your routes, along with understanding <coughs> how to implement math in C++. We're not gonna do the graphical user interface for this. We're just gonna determine right, the shortest path and the low cost trips. And the weight for this is provided here based on the miles. So um, with that, you will need to include the documentation, which is a separate file. So you need to fill out the documentation for your program. Case two is gonna be a combinatoric program. This is for UCR Medical Center volunteers. So you are to use the case that's given here that UCR selects 100 graduates to participate in Doctors Without Border. And the physicians, um, they will be matched based on the language that they speak fluently and their preferences, and that could be expertise. Um, so you will need to provide your own interpretation of that meaning that you can select any type of language or the, the five type of language of your choice and the five type of specialization that they're in, okay? So you are to write a C++ program that demonstrate the match of language selection based on um, at least five languages ac across 20 country matches, and then at least five of the specialization that would be implemented. So when I'm talking about languages, you can use something like Spanish and you can select the nations that would speak Spanish like Mexico, Peru, Spain, et cetera, okay? Or if they speak Chinese, then you can select the nation that has Chinese as a fluent language. So then you will be able to match more of the countries than the language itself. So you need to really make sure that you associate the language with the country match and also their specialization with the country match. And um, for the, the specialization, I provided the Wikipedia page where you can find different specialization like internal medicine, uh, pediatrics, et cetera. And so you can decide on what you want to do with your program there. And I want you to give me the probability of the participants um, based on the language fluency and their expertise. 
and you need to provide supporting documentation with that. Okay, that's case two. Case three is gonna be on Visioneer Cypher decryption. We are going to go over this um, next week where we talk about encryption using Caesar Cypher, which is one dimension and Visioneer is two dimension. So here it explains a little bit about Visioneer, how Visioneer is implemented in that it would use a keyword matching up with the plain text and it's able to cipher the text. And so what you want to do is you want to write a Visioneer encryption program and decryption. So the program should implement encryption and decryption in C++, okay? And so, um, and I will test this. So make sure that you implement it in that your symbols um, also interprets along with white space. A lot of the students face that kind of challenge is that it will encrypt and decrypt mostly plain text without any space and without any kind of symbol. Remember that your compiler is going to see everything as ASCII. So if you're using ASCII encoding, you're going to be limited to the ASCII value or the numerical value that's equivalent to a certain text key. And again, we will touch on Caesar cipher so you can see how that is done in encryption next week. And so you can decide. So make sure that you test your program um, and then look at the limitations and provide that in the documentation. The fourth case is Casino Blackjack. And just to make this a little shorter, we are going to implement one deck of cards that is 25 or 52 cards, and it's going to use your casino rules. So make sure that you take a look at the rule. Um, by just implementing the blackjack in C++ is not just enough. Um, what I'm looking for in this is that it does give you already the probability on how um, someone can hit and someone can win um, at a certain hit after a certain um, number of cards per hand. Now on a single deck, normally that will be 17% for the house advantage. So the more, of, the more decks that they implemented in the shuffle, the higher the house, uh, the higher is the percentage for the house advantage. So keep that in mind. And we are going to only use a single deck just be, to be fair. Okay, so if you're not familiar with blackjack rule, make sure that you take a look at the rules for the blackjack. So what are you doing with this program? You are going to implement a C++ program that simulates a blackjack game. You are going to have a dealer and a player. And the, we are going to do a card guessing program, meaning that we are going to look at the player hand and compare that against the dealer and see what is the probability of winning based on the current hand. So if I'm dealt with two cards, let's say that it's 12, then what is the probability of me hitting the blackjack? So in order to get 21, I have to get a nine. And if there's four nines in a deck, what is the probability behind that? Okay. So it encourages you through this program to look at the probability, like what we talked about with the deck of cards, face cards, and so on. So what I want is I want you for you to show right your player hand and the probability of the player hand winning against the dealer. And that's a little bit more challenging than just a blackjack game. So this case is a little bit more advanced than some of the others in that you have to implement the blackjack game along with looking at what are the cards that are left compared to the cards that were dealt. And then also applying the hit rule, right? If they're hitting a card, every hit that you get, you need to recalculate the probability. So when you're playing these card games, right, uh, the algorithm is implemented. So I want you to think about the initial algorithm that you would use in, in a game like this. And um, 
Now, a lot of the students, depending on the approach, and I did provide some link that I put on my REPL for some of the, the example that you would see. Now, some of those examples are not really exactly quite there, but you can see how they would approach it. Blackjack, remember that it is not suit dependent. That means that I can have a red or a black and it will treat it the same, not like poker, okay? So you can, you can decide on how you would implement the card would be in your array. And so you would have a hand that will be an array, uh, an array of cards that would be dealt and an array of cards that would be shuffled. So then you would be able to implement the if else conditions on how blackjack should be played. And if it's dealt a certain hand, then you need to really output your probability, okay? So what I encourage you to do when you're looking at these course projects cases, you really need to do an outline of your program, right? Um, before you start coding your program, you can do a diagram or you can just, write out your pseudocode, whichever is good for you. I will require that you turn in either one of those in your documentation, either the pseudocode or the diagram itself. Okay, so that I know that you have planned the program properly instead of go and grab the code from someone else. And I do check your code. I read all the, the lines of code for the project. It does take me a long time to grade the project uh, more than usual. And I do give you proper feedback in the comments. Okay, so out of these four cases, you will pick either as a team or by yourself. Just remember, pick the ones that you can handle, right? Um, and start early. Do not wait till the last week to start doing it because you will find that it's gonna be more than you can, you can, you can do within that week and then you're gonna end up not finishing the project. This is why I'm giving you six weeks to do this, okay? Now, there are parts that are gonna be due in different times. They're not due at the end. So the first part is for you to sign up. I put a link to the, the team sign up document. If you're not working in a team, you will be required to sign up. So that way I know which project that you are working on, okay? So you simply click the Google Doc link and then you fill out your name. And if you're working with someone or you're looking for someone, you can put your name there. And if somebody wants to join your group, right? But make sure that we communicate. You can use different type of tools that I had provided. On um, the bottom part, you can use Slack, Microsoft Team, Discord, or Zoom and set aside the time to do the work. You can subdivide up your project into, you know, someone is handling the pseudocode and you will be able to work that with that person to also start writing the program and so on. Um, that I will leave it up to you to coordinate your team tasks, okay? So make sure that we sign up for this and this is due November 5th. That's gonna come up shortly. So I want you to go into the November before Thanksgiving, start thinking about what project you need to do. Okay, now this, if you simply sign up, you get 20 points. All right. Uh, sorry, hold on. I don't know why it's not, it's not loading. Okay, so the next part is gonna be your programming and your documentation. So I already provided the project criteria. We talked about that. For the documentation, you need to download this file, okay? And um, this file basically maps out the things that you need to include in the documentation. Put your name, your team member names, and then answer these questions. Don't just put one sentence, right? You can put together a paragraph that address all the questions, or you can put a few sentences for each of the questions. So what problems are you trying to solve in this project? So if you're doing the blackjack game, you can explain what, what will be the issue that you're trying to solve, what will be your solutions, 
and then explain how you implemented the concept that you learn in probability, right? And then to be able to solve that problem. What is the objective of your program? We said that it is a card guessing game, but you need to expand a little bit further, right? Like on the player hand, how is it guessing? Explain how the user is gonna be interacting with your program. What I'm teaching you here is when you put together your documentation, you need to identify what kind of problem you're solving with your algorithm, how do you approach it, and what goals are you achieving, okay? And that's important. Then next, mention about the probability, how, what kind of concept that you learn from this class that will be applied to the program. And software is never 100% perfect, Right, the first iteration is always there's room for improvement, so we want to, uh, to include the limitations of our program and identify the limitations of our program. So, if you test your program and you find that, right, um, like it, it would you know maybe halt at some point, or um, in the case where the array that you implemented, there's some limitation with the container, you need to make sure that you identify that here. So what will happen is if you do share your source code in which you do on GitHub, if somebody uses that, they can take a look at that and they can improve it. And or later on, you can make a better iteration of that particular program and then to improve your program, okay? Then I would also um, include your flowchart and or pseudocode. So you don't have to do both, but if you do, that's fine. So you would need to start with the pseudocode and then do the flowchart. Many of my students start programming first before they start doing pseudocode, but I highly recommend that you do the pseudocode first and then you can edit it throughout, okay? The things that I'm gonna look for when I'm looking at your flowchart and your pseudocode are all your conditions included? If else statement and loops, I'm gonna closely look at that because a lot of times I see the students map out their program, but they don't really apply the conditions because those are sub processes and sub processes has to be considered as resources are allocated to those sub processes. Okay, so and um, to, and there are many different tutorial on how to properly do pseudocode and how to properly do flowchart. Now, the best tool that I, I would recommend to do flowchart is to use draw.io, okay? You can definitely use Microsoft Word. However, if you use draw.io, you can save it on the cloud and you can also share it with, to your team member and you can edit that. Um, there are a lot of different type of tools that are freely available. Um, so you can choose the tool that you want to use for your flowchart. And when you use those tools, it will provide you with the standard shape for the flowchart. So just make sure that we use standard shape if we're using Microsoft Office or we're using some other tool that doesn't use the standard shape for the flowchart, okay? So I would need to, I will look at your flow and how it branches. Um, you know, so focus on that along with the pseudocode. When you provide pseudocode, I will look for conditions, loops, and how it branches. And that's really important to emphasize because programs just don't go from start to the end without branching. So uh, making sure, and, and if you implement functions, make sure that you know you note the functions, right? Um, variables, container, those things are important in these in these areas. Okay, and any questions? Okay, so use the project documentation guide as a, a template to be able to build out your documentation. One page, two at the max, that's fine. Okay, I don't, I don't need fancy documentation like some people. I just wanna make sure that you have the general concept on how to approach the documentation. And most of the stuff that we do, we do digitally anyway. Okay. So um, that will be the documentation that's provided here. Okay. 
for the submission for part two, two things you need to make sure that you submit. Number one, the documentation that will be in Microsoft Word or PDF, okay? And a uh, second file that needs to sub be submitted is your, your C++ file. If you are writing multiple files, like if you're using modular approach for your program, make sure that you put it into one folder, like a source code folder, and then zip it and upload it for me. So that way when I download it and unzip it, I have all your files together. And so when I test your program or read your code, I can quickly find it. All right, so two things for part two. I thought I had, yeah, I will add the proper rubric there. I thought I linked the rubric, but I guess it didn't go. Okay, so for the GitHub how to, this gives you the general information on how to create your GitHub repo. Um, let me demo it real quick. I know some of you are using GitHub for your class. So you can, you can link your GitHub directly from command line um, or even using certain IDE, it will allow you to do that. But if you don't have that capability or you don't know how, what you can do is you can sign up for GitHub and then you can create a new repository. What that does is it's just gonna store right, the program files and all the things that you need for that particular program. So when you click the new button for the repository, you can just name it, so say CIS7 course pro project, right? And then here you can just say final project. Make sure, this is important, public, okay? Because on the final day, when you turn this in, if it's not public and if I cannot find it, I cannot grade it. Many of the students before you, sometimes they put it on private and they give me a link and I cannot, I cannot see it. So make sure that it is publicly available. What you can do is you can start with the README file, okay? But if you forgot to select this, you can always create a file and name it at readme.md. What that file contains is just general information about the program. Um, things like what is your program name, who created the program, when it was created, how it should be used, what's the objective and so on, or general instructions on how to run the program. Okay, so don't just make a readme and put blackjack and then that's it, right? Um, there is a readme 101, here, I put that here and what should be on the README. So if you don't know what goes on the README, make sure you do that. Now, README, this file is, it uses HTML. So when you're trying to format it, right, make sure that you use, you know, some kind of a, use HTML to format it so it looks decent. Otherwise, it's just gonna have one whole, you know, very long sentence and then things just don't get formatted properly. So you can work together with another person for that. And so if you check this, right here, let me create a repo so I can show you. So let's say that I didn't make a readme on my repository, okay? The link, everything is provided here for me. You can also import your code that comes from your system. You can also push, they, they show you, you how to use the git command there, right? And then you can also create a, a repository using command line. So GitHub does a good job with providing all the basic details that that's what you need, okay? So I'm in my repository here. I gotta make sure that it is public. Hold on one second. Let me drag my Zoom bar here. And if you need to add a file, there's a plus button on the top right. And if you click the drop down menu, it tells you, you know, what do you need? Okay. So you can import in your source code. Okay. You can add in, um, you know, your gist and so on. 
Okay. Now all of your other repository, you can go to your account and be able to do that. So now I'm in my repository and I need to, uh, let me see, I need to make a folder, okay? I need to call it source. So I can go in here and then I can do SRC. And then I can say project, write files. So by standard in practice that you would have a source folder, you can click on it to go inside the actual folder here. And then um, you are going to click create a new file here. And then I can call this readme.md like this. And then in here is where I would put like CI. Seven course project by AC when right and then I can say December 2022 and then I can say this is a uh, what is it let's say a blackjack guessing game stuff like that okay so once you're done, you are going to commit that new file. So basically that is allowing you to save it. Okay. And so now it shows that it's there. Okay. Now notice that it is just one long sentence. So you just need to do a line break. Okay. Basic HTML tutorial will get you through the readme. All right. Next thing, what we can do is we can go back right to this and then you can add your code or you can add a file okay so if you want to upload your files your cpp you can simply do an upload this way okay and then if you wanted to also use like uh or for your code if you want to clone it you can download it but to upload your file your files your cpp you just upload it this way Okay, or create a new file. So if I don't upload, I have to create a new file and then I copy and paste my code in here and I can just say like final project.cpp like this. Okay, and then paste your code in here. So there are two ways that you can do that. Okay, but easiest is probably upload it uh, from, and if you have Git installed on your system, you can link it and so that way you can use the command line like what they had showed. Any questions on GitHub? Hold on, let me save this as example. So when you're done, right, in your source code folder, you should have a readme file and then your project file, at least one, okay? And then if you wanted to add your documentation, you can just upload your dot doc or whatever, and it will all be together in there. Now, when you want me to see this, okay. So what you can do is you can share this link by just giving me the link. If it's publicly available, you can just copy the link but I highly recommend that you open up another browser like Edge or Firefox, paste the link in there and then run it. Okay, see if it works. So let's say that if this is publicly available, I should be able to see it on another browser. Right, there it is. Okay, so make sure that you test your URL. And when you submit this, I'm gonna show you guys this because every semester there's a, always the confusion on where do I go to submit this. Okay, so I do have the tutorial videos on how to you know, use GitHub in case you want to watch the video. Okay, let me go to the student view so I can show you. So let's say that I want to submit this assignment. I'm ready, I'm done, right? Click start assignment. 
there is a URL right here. You see website URL? Okay. So you are going to upload the file, which is the, the evaluation screenshot. And then you when you want to submit the GitHub URL, click that and then paste the URL in here. Okay. Some students, they put it in the comment section because they cannot find that tab. So all of these tabs are available. So you would use website URL. And then if I paste it in here, I would have the URL submitted for this assignment. And then I can click on this tab and I can um, you know, upload my screenshot for my, my team evaluation. Okay, so with that, let's take a look at your team evaluation. So this is the team evaluation. You just go through, answer the questions, right? Put your name, your team name. And if you're working with multiple people, okay? You need to put their name and what you would rate them, right? So it tells you here, your team name, rate yourself, rate your overall for your team, list each of the member, and then you can give them a score between one and 10. I do read this, okay? And when I grade your, your projects, right? If somebody doesn't do anything in the group, then that person just get a very small amount of points compared to the ones that did everything, then they would get a higher higher set of points. Okay, so this is just to be fair for all the contribution that you put into the project. So for part three, once again, team evaluation and GitHub. Okay, any question? Okay. So um, I put some project example. You can take a look at those. They're not, I will add more to it. I think last semester, uh, quite a few groups did really, really good on their project. Like I was super impressed. The only thing that was lacking in one of the group was a database um, because, you know, for, for the amount of time that they put into it, it was a, a well done program. So. What I'll do is I'll try to see if I can link it via the web and I'll put the link and I'll add more of the example um, for the ones. So these are through my repo share, um, as you can see. So there's some, you know, one, uh, a few that you can take a look at and how they would approach these type of, of programs. But don't copy and, and, and paste their code. That's not fair. Okay. Question. Okay, so make sure we work on the project, okay? And then um, if you have any questions, make sure that you address that with me. You can you know, meet with me and doing office hours if you want me to take a look at your program or give you some feedback. Or if you can't do that, you can shoot me a message and then you can provide me with information like on your code and things like that. If you have any questions, you can include your questions and then I'll give you feedback that way. Um, I, I will be happy to take a look at it before you submit it, if that's what you want. Uh, if not, you can just turn it in when it's due and that will be fine too, okay? All right. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about our weekly lecture. Any question as far as the project goes? So in this week, <clears throat> we are going to talk about graphs. And as I mentioned, this is helpful with the solar salesman or the solar sales project, right? We need to be able to interpret maps and uh, or graphs and graphs is very important in computer science. So as you take a look at your notes and your, um, your assignment, we're going to go through that together. So the way that we use graph is we can use it to set up a visual model for transportation, for computer networks, for social media, for communication, for routes in shipping, receiving, sales, um, 
for a lot of things that we use every day. So when you're looking at somebody like UPS or FedEx or even airlines, um, bus companies, right? We can quickly visualize the route or the transportation path or the communication path um, for you know, a lot of these things using graphs. Graphs is also being used in visualization of data and also in data analytics. It's very important, okay? So let's start with what a simple graph would look like. And, you know, depending on the language, there are quite a few libraries that can be used with graphs. And Graphis is one of them that you to see. Um, and there are other libraries that you can use. So if you're familiar with Python, Python is wonderful with visualization, um, especially with graphs and data. Okay, so a simple graph, when you have a graph, you would have vertices that would be um, connecting. So all of these round, what we call the node, right? Like A, B, C, C, D, E, F. Those are vertices, okay? And the edge are gonna be the connecting line that goes from one vertex to another vertex. And these vertices can represent a lot of different things. It can be computers, it could be cities, it could be, um, you know, bus, trucks, uh, a lot of things, right? So when, or when you're looking at things like bus stop, right? So when you want to map out a bus route for a person that goes from Riverside to Moreno Valley, we can take a look at each of the bus stop, right? The connecting bus or trains um, or even cell towers. So there, there is a lot of, there are a lot of different type of applications that we would use using graph. So when you look at the graph, what you want to do is you want to look at the adjacent, the neighbor nodes or the vertices, okay? So if I'm looking at A, who is its neighbor? C and D, right? or when I look at C, it's connecting to A and B. So the adjacent vertices is always gonna be connecting to that point, that vertex, okay? So when they're not adjacent, like C and F is where we are, we're, we're not neighbors, right? We are gonna have to go through B to get to F, so when you're looking at something like transportation company, if you have to go to a bus stop to get to another bus stop, the second bus stop is not adjacent, right? To the first. So C is then adjacent to B, but it is not adjacent to F in that we have to pass through B in order to get to F. So what does this do for us? So when we're looking at how we map the data, in transferring the data. So let's say that all of these are computer systems, right? If I start with A, I can transmit data to D and C, right? But in order to get my data from A to F, I have to go A, C, B, F, right? Or I can go the other way, A, D, F. So we can get it to a destination system, but if it's not adjacent to the original system where it, it starts, right, the source system, then we have to be able to, to transfer it through another system, okay? So now in the, in the graph, what we want to do is we want to look at the number of vertices that we have. In this case, in a simple graph, we have six vertices and seven edges, right? Now, 
when you don't have a certain direction in the edge like this, it can go both way. And when I teach IT classes, that's important when we think about how data is sent, right? Because sometimes some system can only receive and not send. And some system would send and receive. And then some system would send half the speed. Some system would send full speed. So we would then have to, to, to consider how is the data gonna get there and it needs to get there with the, the quickness, right? It has to be there. Um, so we want to really map that out, okay? So then what you need to do is you need to first list all the vertices. So here I have A, B, C, D, E, F, right? All our vertices. And again, that can represent nodes, and when we say nodes, nodes could be a system, right? It could be a terminal, like a sales terminal or a ticket terminal. It could be, um, you know, any kind of object. And then when we're looking at the edge, how one vertex is connecting to the next, like A to C or C to B. So we want to list out all the edges and you would use the curly race for this. Then after that, we would then need to list out our adjacencies, right? Basically from the edge, we can interpret who is adjacent to who, right? Like D is to F. So D, since it's connecting to F by the edge, that means it is adjacent. So if there's a present of the edge, then we would say that it would be adjacent, okay? So that's one example. So here, what we can say is that when we're looking at this example, this graph, okay? In the 16.2, it talks about A, B, C, and E have two degrees. So when they have when they have two neighbors, right? When they have two edges connecting to that particular vertex, like E, E has two because it has two neighbors, two adjacent vertices, two edges. So that means that it has a degree of two. And so is A, right, and C and B. Now D is uh, an F, they have three, a degree of three, right? Because it has three edges connecting to the vertex. And so when you don't have a uh, any kind of value that indicates the edge, right? The weight for the edge, that could be distance in kilometer, it could be miles, it could be priority values, right? Um, why is that important? Well, sometimes in network environments, we can see that some system have a priority value and how it transfer a certain way, kind of like, you know, how you're looking at your Google map to go from home to school, right? And it would tell you usually would be the shortest path, right? The, the, the one with the, the least distance in miles or kilometer, okay? Depending where you live. And so therefore you would then have weights to the edge that would represent the street or the ways that you would travel. And we can see the same thing with the system on how it would transmit over that line, right? Some path would be more in priority, higher in the priority compared to other paths, okay? And we can set that up. So with that said, that's why it's saying that if you don't see any kind of value next to the edge, then we can assume that all of them are ones, okay? They are all equal in weight. 
And then that's, we're gonna come back to that at the end. Okay. So then how can we establish a, a path? Like what we said before, we can map from one vertex to another vertex. If I need to go from A to F, okay, I can go A, C, B, F. I can go F, E, D, right? To go from F to D, or I can go directly from F to D. I can pass it through E or I can go from F directly to D. And then I can also go the long way where I go over the edge twice, right? So I can go A, D, E, F, D, A, C, B, F. And as you can see that here, so that's considered a long path. Okay, any question? So let's do number one. So we would start with looking at this graph and you can always stretch it out to see better. First, we're gonna start with listing all the vertex, all the round, right? all the round shape, your vertices. So I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? I have A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. So that's the first step for A. Then for B, we are gonna list the edges. So what I normally do is I start with the left and then I move right to the right. So that way I can track right my edges. So I start with B, G, that's the first one. Then I go B, A, second one. And then now I move right to A. So A, E, A, E, and then A, F, A, C, and then I move over to C. And so if you decided that you wanna start with G, you can definitely do that as long as you cover all the edges, okay? So here I have from B, G. So you need to list all the, the edges. So after CF, we would do CD. And then we, we also have to list CA because we can go from C to A. And then DC. DE. And then I have E, A, E, F, E, D, E, G. And then I move over to F. List all the edges. F has four degrees. So F, E, F, A, F, C, and F, G. And then I move over to G. G has three degrees, so we can just say G, B, G, E, and G, F. Now, this is non-directional, so as long as we establish the edge, that's fine. If it is directional, then we have to go from a certain vertex to the other vertex, okay? It doesn't go the other way if it's directional. After I have the edge listed, then I can identify the degrees for each of my vertex. 
as the degree would represent the number of edges that vertex is connected to. So we can say that A, A has four because if you count the edge, there are four, right? So A, E, and F, they all have four. F has four, A has four, and E has four. Then we can look at the next level, which is C and G. C has three, and G has three. So if there's an edge, that means that we, we have adjacency, right? It's adjacent. Then we have B and D, B has two and D has two. Okay, so that will be the degree of vertices. Any question? Then the next step after we list the degree of vertices, then we need to identify the adjacent nodes. We can say that B is adjacent to A and G. It's connecting with A with an edge and B connects to G with an edge. So it is adjacent. So when you look at this, you think about how can I represent that? You can say that, okay, if we need to map it out, if the edge is present, then we can say that it is adjacent. That means that it is next to it or connected to it. So then we would implement right, the if condition. Now B is not adjacent to, it does not directly connect with an edge to E, to F, to C, and to D, right? It has to go through the other vertices to get there. Then we can do the same thing to A. We can say that A is adjacent to E, F, C, and B. It has edges that connect to those vertices. It is not adjacent to G and D, so A has to go through B to get to G or E to get to G. So it's not adjacent to G or D. Then you can look at E, which is the next one here. And so this gives you practice and it goes, the list goes on, right? On what is adjacent to, okay? So E would then be adjacent to A, F, G, and D. So if we visually look at the map this way, we have to think about how the computer would be able to identify, right? So what this shows you is that we have to first really see how we can go from one vertex to another and determine which one is adjacent. Then we can program it.
Okay, any question? So we wanna list the adjacent and non-adjacent for D. And that can be tedious, but it can be done, right? So in actuality, we have to identify all of them. So that way we wanna make sure that all of the vertices, right, would be included. And these will become attributes of that vertex. Okay. I, I copy the same thing down there. So that will be for number one. Then for E, what we wanna do is we then identify the degrees of vertices. We can say A, let's make this bigger. A, F, and E have degree four. It has four edges connect to it. Your C and G has three. And then we have B and D has two. Any question? Then after we identify the degree of vertices, we would then create a path. So for F, it tells you to refer to exercise one graph and identify the path for each of the vertex. So we can do a simple path, that's really easy. You can pick any starting point and then the destination, right? We can do B to G, that's one. Or if I want to go from B to G, going the long the, around, right? We can go B, A, E, G. Okay, and notice that when you pass them from one, when it goes from one vertex to another, we don't repeat. Because if you repeat, right, it's no longer a simple path. Okay, so no re repetition. So I can go from A, right, to C, to D, to E, and G, that's one path, that's a simple path. Now the long path would be, right? Say, we can start with B and then we can go A, C, D, E, A, F, G. And then we can end there. Actually, go G, E again, and then back to F, and then G. So we would then take the long way there by crossing over the vertex multiple times. So and you asked me why, how is this applied, right? Dr. Wynn, how is this applied? So if you're familiar with system updates or for like status, uh, database, things like that, right? Because when we, let's say that we start with B, we update A, A gets updated with additional information. 
it updates C, C gets updated with additional information, it updates D and then E, and then we have to go back and we update G, and then we have to go back to, because G gets more data added, then it updates E again, and then come back to F and then G again, okay? Because as it hits each of the nodes, right, possibly that things might be added like configurations, data, uh, users, objects, so many additional things that change the state of the system where we would then have to re-update it. So then it becomes a long path, you see? Question. Okay, number two. Two is a little different, two is similar to what we've seen with the example. So you do have maybe a couple of vertex or a few or, you know, that will be not connected to the rest. Okay. And from my standpoint, right, we can, I'm more familiar with like the, the networks, the IT, the cybersecurity portion. So I'm gonna give you an example based on that. We might have isolated system, systems that are being used for testing, right? Or highly secured systems that we would use for design, for proprietary design, right? that is not connected to the rest of the networks, right? These systems, they only update each other while the other ones are interconnected and they update one another throughout. So then C and D are non, they're not adjacent to the rest of the others, right? The only C is adjacent to D, S, D is adjacent to C, and that's it. So for number two, we start with listing the vertices, and that's easy. We have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Then we are going to list the edges. And so you don't have to do all of them, right? You already know how to do that. And that's important. So you can do most. Okay, so we would have B to A, B to G, A to G, A to E, A to F, E to G, E to F, and then lastly, C to D. So I list them. So after we have the edges, we count up the number of edges for each of the vertex to get the degree of vertices. Then we have E, F, when you look at the E and the F, they both have the degree of three. So there are three adjacent neighbors. And then we would do A and G that has four. So G has four edges and A has four edges. You can also denote them by using the superscript one, two, and three for the degree. So if I wanted to denote, right, like E and F, like this, I can say that it is to the degree, to the third degree, 
that means it has three. Okay, so after we identify the degree of the vertices, we would then identify the adjacent and non-adjacent. Question. Okay. So I just recopy and paste the picture as it drops on the second page and I wanted to be able to see it when I did this, right? So we can say B is adjacent to A and G. B is not adjacent to E, F, C, and D, right? Because it has to pass through other vertex vertices to get to there. And then A is adjacent to E, G, and F, and B. And A is non-adjacent to C and D, as they are here. And then again, we do that for C. C is adjacent to D, SD is adjacent to C. And C and D, they're non-adjacent to, they're not adjacent to A through G. A, B, E, F, G. So technically, they're not adjacent to themselves as well, right? We will see that when we put it in a matrix. Question? No question, huh? And the same thing for D. And then we can do the same thing for E. I know this is tedious, but you can't leave things out, right? When you're looking at the overall, you have to really get into each of the vertex as they could contain data, important information, and so on. So we wanted to list them. And then F, what is it adjacent to? And what is it not adjacent to? And then G. After we have the adjacency list, we would then list the degree of the vertices. C and D has one. B has two, EF has three, and GA has four. And we can also use the superscript as well, right? We talked about that. Question. So then we would start identifying our paths. 
So a simple path, again, simple path, we don't repeat over, we don't cross over that vertex multiple times, only once. So we can go from B, A, F, B, G. Right, or we can just go C to D. So I wanna make sure that you remember what a simple path is, right? Make sure we know that for quiz and test. We can also do cycle where it starts at one point and return back to that point after it goes through the vertices, like B, B, A, F, E, G, and back to B. And then we would be able to identify no path for this one as C has no path to F or D is no path to F. Okay. There's no way that we can connect those. No path. And then the long path. So as we talked about long path being crossed over the vertices multiple times. Any question? So for the final and the quiz, you will be prompted with questions like, which of the following option is a simple path for this graph? Or which of the following option is a long path for this graph? Or no path or cycle? Or it would ask you which vertices, which of the following vertices would be adjacent to A or C or F, and you have to know them. Pretty easy. So make sure we know how to read the graph. Question for number two. Sorry, let me move this up a little. Okay. So now you are gonna come across something that's directional because it has an arrow. So in a directional graph, you are only gonna be able to use it as the direction it's pointed, okay? So let me switch back to the notes real quick. We already talked about some of the path. And then you also gonna have graphs that have weighted edge, values next to the edge. If you don't have that, as we said, they are treated as equal. So they all ones. Okay, so weighted graphs would be something like that, or you would see a value next to the edge. So when you look at the path, you would then need to add them up for the value for that path. So a weighted path, if we're looking at from A to O here, right? We go A to D, that's five. And then H from, from D to H, that's two. So we add two. And then from H to K, that will be four. So we add four. And then from 
from K to O, we would add five. So going back to the project, right? You're given the weight for the path and you would need to determine how can you determine that would be the low cost path when the sum is the least. So when the, the total value for that path is gonna be the lowest, that will be the lowest cost path. Is it necessarily the shortest path? Not always, okay? So when we say the shortest path would be, if I need to get from A to O, how many vertex do I have to cross over to get there? It's like saying from here to your work, and how many streets do you have to go over to get there, right? One route, it takes you five streets. Another route takes you 15 streets. So the shorter path would be five streets. Okay. Compared to something that would have more vertices to go over. Now the low cost would be like we said, the lowest sum of that path. Okay, so here um, it talks about why we really need to look at the adjacency list and build out the adjacency matrices. That's gonna allow you to really map out, right, how, Things are connected together like data or systems, right? Or in the case where if you're looking at flights, right, connecting flights. So, and then they would do a combination of that. So when we're saying, okay, from California to Atlanta, then to New York, then, or we can go California, Arizona, and then New York and so on. So it needs to be able to map out all of these routes, right, for the flight. And then based on that, it would then determine, right, the cost because each of the connecting flight has some kind of cost. And you would see this, right, for airlines, tickets, and so on, even train and bus and, and, and et cetera. Okay. Okay, so before we get here, let's do the next one. So for number three, this is directional. We can't go both ways. We can only go one way. Okay. The way that the arrow is pointed on some of them. And then on the green, it can go both ways. So just like the other one, we need to list the vertices first. So A through G. Then next, what we're going to do is we are going to, uh, sorry, we are going to identify the edges. We can go A to B, but not B to A, right? Because it's pointing from, it's going from A to B only. And then from B, I have to send it to G or we can go G to B. And for my networking students, they are really going to be familiar with this because we can actually set route for routers, right? Like when you're connecting to an internet, it's passing your request from your home, right? Network, which is your router that you either subscribe or bought and subscribe to service with internet service provider. You connect to their network and then it connects to autonomous systems and then eventually across other networks. So it's really the way that we look at routing is each of these vertex represent a hop or a router. So then it would go from one to another. And sometimes you can send them on that same path every single time, right? 
or it can pick and choose, right? Which, which is the most available at the, the shortest, open shortest path first, or it would be, you know, so there's very depending on the type of routing systems and the protocol. But in that sense, you get the idea of how it would be directional. So after we identify the edges, okay, we identify the degree of the vertices. So G has four, B has two, C has two, D has two, and F has five, and so on. And again, you don't have to list them all. I wanna make sure that you know how to do this. So do a few for number three. Then for D, we are going to look at the adjacent. So B is adjacent to G and A and B is not adjacent to E, F, D, and C as it has to pass through the others to get to those vertices. So we list a few adjacent and non-adjacent. Then we would identify our path. I think I used the wrong place here. So we would have a simple path. We're gonna go from A to E to F, A, E, F, right? I could not go F, E, A though because it's directional, right? I can only send it one way. And then for no path, we don't have a connection between um, A and C. Because even if you go A, G, F, D, I could not send it to C because C is going, it, it can only send, not receive, right? the arrow goes from C, not to C. So A and C have no path. That's a tricky one. And then the long path would be that we can go through A twice and B twice. And then the cycle, we start from a, a vertex and then return back to that vertex. You can say A, E, F, A. Or A, B, G, A. There will not be a cycle here, though, C, F, and D. Because we're going to go from C to F to D, but we cannot send it back to C. So no cycle on this one. Question. Okay, still got a little bit to go. This one's a little longer chapter, so a little more tedious, right? But that's okay. All right. So now, once you have the adjacency list, you are going to build a matrix. Okay. So for number four, it tells you to look at the graph and you're going to build out the adjacency list as a matrix. You can use the matrix bracket, right? In, in insert formula and then use the bracket symbol. 
I found it a lot easier for me to visualize and fill things in when I use a table. So I simply put in the number of rows and columns based on the number of vertices that I have. So I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then the same thing here. And then I fill in the value. So from A to A, for a vertex, it cannot be connecting to itself. So you need to put a zero as these are non-weighted edges, okay? So zero from A to itself. From A to B, it is an adjacent, so one, put a one, okay? From A to, um, so we're gonna go from A to A, right? Then A to B, put a one. A to C, put a one, right? A to C, it's connecting with an edge, put a one. A to D, A to D, no, so zero. A to E, no, right? It has, it's not directly connect, so zero. And then A to F, no connection directly. It's not adjacent, so zero. And then A to G, it is, so put a one. And then we repeat the same thing for B. B to A, there is adjacent, so one. B to B, not to itself, zero. B to C, no, it has to go through A, so zero. B to D, zero. B to E, zero. B to F, also a zero. And B to G, there's an edge, so one. And then you continue with C, vertex C. C to A, yes, one. C to B, no, right? C to C, no. It cannot connect to itself. C to D, yes, one. C to E, one. And C to F, one, and then zero. So at this point, you should know how to fill it out. So by the end, you should have the edge, the one that is adjacent would have a one and the one that's not adjacent or to itself, that will be zero, right? So you can do the rest. So we would be able to establish the matrix by knowing the adjacency or the adjacent vertex. Then from there, we'll be able to build out our matrix. Question. Now let's do number five, which is a weighted graph. So again, I would be using a table, but you can use your matrix bracket. So the number of vertex, right? We have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So we list those, so you can add the table.
then I would start with A. A is to A, no, so zero. It cannot connect itself. A to B, so the weight here is three. So you put a three. So instead of the ones and zero earlier because it's not weighted, now it becomes weighted. So you need to put, you need to put the value or the weighted, the weight value for the edge. Okay, so three. I'm sorry, three here. So A to C, that will be A to C, that will be five, so five. A to D, it's not directly connecting, so zero. A to E, not direct connect, not adjacent, so zero. A to F, also not adjacent, so zero. And then A to G, there's eight, so you put eight. And just like the previous exercise, but now we use the weight value, we would do the same thing for B, C, D, F, E, F, and G. Okay, so B to A is three, B to B, to B is zero, B to C is zero, and then B to D is zero, B to E is zero, and B to F is zero, and you get the point B to E is, or B to G is seven. So once we fill everything in, right, we would have a matrix that contains the weighted edge value for all our vertices, which represent your adjacency list. And sometimes you also, for programming, right, you also, they refer to graph in when you really work with data structure like tree, like binary tree, self-balancing binary tree, right? There are different type of trees. So basically it's gonna connecting one node to another node, you're gonna have like, the root and then the branches and then so on to really map out the data. So for number five, we just have to come up with the matrix for our graph. question. And then the same thing for six. And this one is not weighted. So you just use ones and zeros. One for the one with the edge or adjacent and then zero without. So practice for six. I fill in some of it for you to see, but you can do the rest. Okay, so make sure we complete those. And then the same thing for number seven. Any question with building out matrix for adjacency? We will focus a little bit more on adjacency when we do the, the lab this week for graph. All right. Okay, so six and seven, you can practice on your own. I don't want to take up your time just going over the same thing over and over again. Let's talk about um, the path. So 
So in addition, also I forgot to mention that when you're looking at like the, the matrix, right? You can take a look at the adjacency to really represent your vertices across. Um, and the way that the book they write it is like this. Okay. Let's talk about traversal. So as I mentioned, sometimes graph can be utilized for tree and we need to look at how it would traverse from one node to another node as far as which node contain the data. And to traverse a graph, it says that you must visit all the vertices on the graph by following the edges. And you want it to do it systematically. And when we're looking at like the, the simple path, I mentioned that you can visit only the vertex ones. We don't, we, we don't go over it again. So in the deep first search, it tells you that you need to move forward from the starting vertex as far as you can go without repeating the vertex, then back up one edge and look for another vertex to visit. So it's gonna go forward without repeating. So it starts with the simple path, then it's going to do one backup, so reverse one. And then it's going to look at the adjacent. And it's going to go that way. So as it back up one edge, we would see this as a recursion. It's recursive. And this is depth first search. So in the depth first traversal, it used the adjacency list to guide the search. And so we often see this when it's looking for, it's searching for what, for data, for, you know, values, etc. So it's going to rely on the adjacency list in order to traverse. Okay, we can just build the matrix and do do the adjacency list for nothing, right? So let's say that if we start at A, and that's what the example is saying here, we're going to proceed to B, which is next to A. Then from B, we're going to go to H. And then from H, right, we're going to go to F, to I, and then to D. We're going to go as far as we can go, which is we're going to reach D. And then to C and to E. Now, alternately, it can back up one, right? Back up one, as we get to see here, it's gonna back up one and then it's gonna alternately go the other way from D directly to E instead of D to C. So that's what it says here. Okay, here's another example. So here's this graph. You start with A, you go to A, B, H, F, I. Okay. Or you can do B, A, B, back up to A, D, F, E. On the breadth first search, 
it's need to visit all the vertices adjacent to the starting vertex, then do a breath first search from each of those vertex. So it's going to go A, right? A, B, H. Now it's going to do the, the breadth first search. What is it looking for? It's looking for the adjacent neighbor. Okay, so A, it can go A, F, and then I, or F and then H. Or we can do A, C, and then C, or E, or F. So it's going to refer to the adjacency to be able to do the breadth first search at D. So when you look at that program at this stage, right, when it gets here, what is it going to refer to? It's going to look at the adjacency list. So then you would say that if, right, D is adjacent to C, E, and I, then it's going to, it's going to search the adjacent nodes in order to determine the next path. So it's going to connect from one node to the next node, and then in the next node, it's going to look at the adjacency list in order to proceed. It's kind of like saying, you, you, you want to map out your trip from home to work, but you don't know how the traffic is going to be until you get to the next street. So when you get to the next street, you're going to then map out all the adjacent street based on right, how heavy is the traffic. Then it's going to search based on if the traffic is really light, you're going to go down that path. So it's going to look at multiple streets that are connecting to the, the, the street that you, the street after, the first street after your starting point. Okay, question. So let's do the last one and then we'll call it a night. So we need to do a deaf first traversal path for this graph. Do eight and nine. So we can pick, and I simply just go from G to E. From, yeah, from G to E or G to F. So we would then go from G to E. Of course, we can just go G to E like this. Or if we follow the directions, we can do a depth first traversal path. We can go G, A, B, C, D, F. But look, F has two ways, right? If we want to get to E, then it will go E. So here, what it's going to do is going to do the search. And then, so if I get to B, it has to reverse one and then go to E, right? So then we would get at F, it's gonna search for the adjacent and then it's gonna go to E. For the back, the first traversal path, we would then start with G and again, we would send it down to A. Or, and then back up to G and then we're gonna do E. Okay, and then A, uh, wait, G, A, back up, do E, and then from A, we're going to go to B, C, D. So let me refill this so I return to G, okay, and then from A to E, and then B, C, D, E, F. Okay, so we start at G, we go to A, we turn to G, right? Go to E. And then at A, we're gonna go to, because it got here already, we're gonna go to B, C, and then go to D and then F.
Okay. So we don't have to follow it like we did with the simple path where it only can be here and then get to the next one. Once you get it there already, right, we can go back to the previous node as it traverse back and then go the other way, um, send it the other way to the next vertex. Or when it got to A, it's gonna seek the next path by looking at the adjacency. And then that's how it, when it's at A, it can go to B and then to B to C and then C to D and so on by looking at the adjacency. Okay. Then for number nine, similarly, if we want to do a breath first traversal starting at vertex F and we can go from F to A, let's say to the other way, we can go F, B, and then back to F, go to E. Let me put a note so you don't get confused when you read your answer. So when we get to B, we're going to be back at F go to E and then um, since we're at B, we already there earlier. So we're gonna go to B at B and then we're gonna go to C and then D. And then at, um, Oh yeah, I meant at F, it's already at E. I don't know why I put G and A there. One second, so D and then back to F. So we're already at F and then we are going to go to E. So at E, then we are gonna go to B it will not reach A. The only way that we can make it reach A is if we start at G. Okay. So as you can see, it can traverse based on the node that it's already visited and looking at what's adjacent to it and then be able to send it that way. For any path, that's easy. You can just list any any node. So we can go from F go from F to. I don't know why I list D there. From F to B to C to D. And then we can go from, we can leave it like that. But if we want to traverse in any path, we can definitely do that. So we can do F to B, back at F to go to E. B, C, back to B, right, then to C, and then to D, to F. Or if you start at G, you can go G, E, and you're already here, so you can traverse back, go to A, B, and then finish there. There are certain notes that will not be reached. Like if I want to go to A, I can only start at G because this is directional. It's a little bit more tricky than the, the bi-directional ones. Okay. Any question? So here it talks about your traverse, traversal breath first search. Make sure that we know how to do that for 
our project as well. Actually, no, I didn't require that. I think it's easy. Let me double check. But for the path, you need to make sure that you have the shortest path, the lowest, lowest cost, okay? That needs to be implemented in the program. We can refer to any path here. It's simply just mark the vertex that it visits. So when you, when it actually visited it, right, the attributes is changed in case you need to come back. And then I touch on the shortest path. So that just means that it crossed the least number of edges. That means the least number of vertices that it crosses that will give you the shortest path to the destination compared to the lowest cost, which is gonna be referring to the sum of the weighted edge. Okay. Lowest cost is the same as cheapest path. So this right here, cheapest path is implemented in a lot of different things. Um, and here the book talks about how certain algorithm is implemented. Cheapest path is also implemented in your communication systems, uh, networks, internet, a lot of different things that we have to use this for. Okay. And then in the in routing, we also use spanning tree, and you probably heard of spanning tree when you take data structure. Okay. And so you can take a look at Kruskal and Prim's algorithm when it looks at the minimal sp uh, spanning trees. So then it would just go based on the weight, and then it will branch out to the total distance for the neighboring cities. So the takeaway from this is to know how to read your graph making sure you know the difference between the weighted, the simple path, the weighted graph, um, knowing your traversal path, that's gonna be important for your tests. And I will go over the final exam questions um, in week 13 or 14. Um, and then the exam is gonna have um, all the questions that we have gone over um, in our assignments and quizzes and things like that, you're gonna see similar questions. Okay, that's all she wrote for today. Um, go ahead and type your name into, oh, I forgot to give you this. So the shortest path for nine, right? We just, we can go, we can pick a point starting from F. So we can go to F, right? So the easiest we, F to E, but we can go F, B, C, D. And in this case, we're required by direction. So it doesn't really matter. We only gonna be one, two, three, three vertices after F. And then the weighted one, all we do here is we are going to sum up. So if we're gonna go from F to B, for example, we can say F E A B, that's gonna give me F B, I'm sorry, F E A B, add them up. So this one equals to A. We can go F E D C A B, which gives me 21. Or we can go F, G, A, B. So F, G, A, B, which gives me 15. And then F, D, E, A, B, which gives me 18. 
So once you have the sum, you're gonna go with the least, which gives you the cheapest path, which is FEAB. And this will be valid for your project, right? So calculate the sum of your, your edges and the lowest, that's gonna be the one that's the cheapest or the lowest cost. Question. Okay, so I'm gonna start recording. Go ahead and type your name into the chat for attendance. And then um, if you have questions, I'll stick around for questions. <laughs> 